the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon me. One final breath he gave, as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease.
sing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Bless me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from. How great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave this God my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above, seal it for thy courts above. I was lost with a broken heart, you picked me up, now I'm set apart. From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words can say I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days I'll fix my eyes following your ways Forever free in unending grace Cause you are, you are, you are my freedom We lift you higher, lift you higher
me a censor cause what he did he deletes his sin the king and servant I flee Good morning, everybody. All right, we're opening up with a, an old hymn this morning, so why don't you stand, please? sins and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Jesus knows our every weakness. Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? with the load of care precious savior still our refuge take it to the lord in prayer do thy friends despise forsake thee take it to the lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Thou will find a solace there.
Well, we ha we'll have Miss Ann until um, uh, she g goes on American Idol, and then um, <laughs> then we'll have to do it remotely. Uh, but thank you. I want to welcome you this morning, and uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. There's times where we, especially with COVID, where you, you wondered if there ever was going to be a point where you could gather in person again. And sometimes we take a lot of that for granted. But I am grateful that we are here today. Before I pray, I've been, um, I've been talking to you a little bit about telling your story. And I was so excited because I knew after two weeks of talking about telling your story that Christine's uh, notes would be filled up with everybody wanting to tell their story. Well, zero people. <laughs> and so, but I know their story out there. So I want to encourage you. Again, sometimes you think, well, my story is not the Lifetime Channel movement or Hallmark story. It, it's, it's an incredible because it's your story. Remember, it's, it's how you came to know Jesus it's what have you done in the times where uh, you just really had to trust him? It's the everyday times in your life. It's the, uh, the times where the Lord has asked you to step out on faith. Um, so, and, and so telling your story. Uh, or, in, or when God's asked you to be a, a stretcher bear to someone else. So, just briefly, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Did anybody have this week a time where you just knew God did something ordinary in your life this week that you can just praise him for this morning? If there's not, I'm not, I'm not going to um, be like the... Um, the person that keeps on saying one more verse, but I just want to open it up to you. Did anybody have a moment this week where they saw God at work in the ordinary star? Amen. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be Noah, where there was like 40 days of no sun? Uh, so I felt, I felt like... I thought for a minute I might be needing to build a boat uh, this week. Some, someone else, has there been a point this week? It's in the ordinary sometimes. Yes, Wayne. Amen. For those that are that are streaming, uh, Wayne's uh, great granddaughter was born uh, this week. Uh, men hardly get the details that women always want. Uh, so, uh, do you know how big? Oh, good for you. I never. I just said she. I always say she's plump and long, and they want more details than that. So, um, but praise God, man, when God brings a, a, a new life into the world. Someone else, what did God do in your week? Yes, ma'am, Miss Libby. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> Amen. Yeah, I, I, so um, Miss Libby Lane, there was a trouble with her vaccination, but she was able to get her shot, and, and she's complete for those that are streaming. Can I be greedy and just get one more? What did God do? It, just John. Uh-huh. Amen. John's praising God for, for the breath that God gives him and the life that God gives him. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, Carson. Okay, a beautiful family. Oh. Oh, Carson says God gave him a beautiful family. But, of course, he was looking at his mom while he's saying that, so... good to be in God's house. I just want to tell you before I pray that in just uh, the, when we do the spotlight video I promised you that you would be able to see many of you went to Maine and you'll just have to tell the stories of what that house looked like uh, but you'll be able to get to see some of those pictures of the house uh, from Maine uh, in just a little bit. But let's pray together. Jesus Thank you for today, and I ask God that you would clearly move in this service so that we can know that we have not only been into church, but that we've been in your presence, and we know that you have been here. And so, Lord, may your presence be glorified and magnified today. And, Lord, I pray for Jane Sterling, Pastor Daryl's uh, wife. And, Lord, I'm going to pause at this moment and just allow quietly... folks that are here to lift up prayer for her healing for the pneumonia that she is uh, battling post-COVID. Lord, many prayers. We're lifted up right now to your throne for Miss Jane. In Jesus' name, amen. Sit on this side with me over here. Good morning. How are y'all? Good. In Sunday school this morning, y'all learned about worshiping God, right? Why is it that we're only supposed to worship God? The Lord is, He is, right, the Lord did make all of us. He is the only God. It's so important that he even made the very first commandment, which is a set of rules that we need to follow, to do not have no other gods before me. I want to ask y'all, I want you to tell me something that you're either thankful for or something that, that God has done for you. Prayer. Prayer? 
because it helps you to pray. I'm thankful for my family. Thankful for your family. I heard Carson say that a minute ago also. Yeah, there's a lot of things to be thankful for. Taylor, are you thankful for your sister and your mommy and daddy? Yes. Oh, you are so sweet. Yeah, great job. Red it color is and this color. Yeah. It's really great um, to be thankful for everything that you have, but not to worship any of that. Because the Lord, he gets really, really sad when we decide to worship other people or objects um, or, or different things. But it's also important for... God does get mad if we try to... It makes him very, very sad if we try to worship the devil. God in heaven there's no sadness or unhappiness. All you feel is happy. Yeah, but it hurts God's heart just like it hurts your mama's heart if you do something wrong. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm going to see if I'll write it down. But God loves it when we remember to thank him for all the good things that he's done for us. I have a Bible verse today. It's in Deuteronomy. Okay, it starts with Genesis. And what comes next? Genesis. Yeah, but what comes after Genesis? Um, um, Exodus, Genesis, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Yeah, I wanted to show off what Miss Renette has been teaching Harley. Yes, in um, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 4 in the International Children's Bible, it says, Serve only the Lord your God, respect him. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and be loyal only to him. So remember to be thankful in everything, the good stuff, the bad stuff, and everything in between. Okay, let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us this beautiful day and allowing us to come together and worship you. Please help us to be remindful of all the, that you have given us and all that is yet to come. Continue to bless this church and be with those who are suffering. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, you are going to go back with Miss Erin, okay?
Let's stand, please. stay in the garden with him though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is called can be seated.
counselor, comforter, keeper. Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You Well, if you can't preach after that, you might not be able to preach. Thank you, Ann. How many of you were amazed that were um, that went to Maine with us of the pictures? Anybody? When you saw the house? How many of you, when you were working on the house, wondered, would this ever get finished? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and so I hope uh, Pastor Durrell was watching because... Uh, it was a burden on his heart to see that house get completed, and uh, it was a, a lot of love in progress, and a lot of um, volunteers like your own uh, self. You saw the guy that I want to be like, uh, the drywaller with the stilts. I, I just really think those are really cool, and um, I, I do want to let you guys know that um, uh, your pastor search team is uh, doing a great job. You elected a great group of people. I'm enjoying getting to know them. And the Lord is really moving in that team. And uh, it is our hope. Don't hold us to it. But it is our hope that... Um, before summer, 
wise drive will have a path. Um, I will be here preaching for you for the next, this Sunday and next Sunday, and then a church that just lost their pastor, Bethel Baptist. Um, I've got to kind of, i got to pop over to there and help them. But in the month of March, I have really set you guys up for a blessing. Um, the preacher that will be preaching the month of March will be Daryl Gaddy. And Daryl is, um, you just need to um, maybe wear tennis shoes when you um, are, are there because when he gets going, it's zoom. Uh, and uh, we worked together in Detroit. And I was so impressed with him when God brought me to Sumter. I said, um, I don't know how it's possible, but I want you to come to Sumter. And so God brought Daryl to Sumter. And so uh, Daryl is a African-American evangelist. And as soon as he got here, the state convention fell in love with him. And, um, and they said, we want him. And I said, okay, as long as we can, uh, he can still connect with us. And so now Daryl works uh, in the church planning uh, area, our team, with the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And then it is my hope to be back uh, with you on Easter Sunday. So... Um, and because uh, right now there's a church just like you were in shell shock when Pastor Darrell said, I am leaving. Uh, Bethel Baptist is sort of in that, that place, so pray for them. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the book of Acts through the lens of being a church on the move. And we sort of define the church on the move as one who expects to see the movement of God. And so this morning we're going to continue to look at more clues or adjectives or descriptions of a church on the move. And the passage this morning is not one where many preachers choose to preach from and you're going to see why but I believe there's some things that we can glean from this really unique encounter in the Bible so if you have your Bibles uh, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 5 beginning in verse number 1 Acts chapter 5 beginning in verse 1 so if you have your Bibles uh, you can read it from there, or if you want to read it from the screen, whatever it is, I want your eyes to be on the word of God that will never fail. Now, but there was a certain man named Ananias, who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount with his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Now let me give you the context here. The context is in the verses prior to uh, Acts 5, it talks about such unity and commonality in the church that, that, that people were actually selling property. They felt so much, they didn't want anybody to be poor or to suffer within their, their body, and so they would sell property and, and bring it to the church. This was not something that was commanded, but it was something that was led by the people within it. And, and so Ananias and Sapphira make a big presentation, I believe, that said, we're going to sell, we feel led to sell this piece of land, and we're giving it all. And everybody probably went, wow, we're giving it all to the church. 
But verse 2, they brought part of the money. Claiming it was the full amount. Okay, go on. Go on. Verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. Or you, you held back something for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. You could have done whatever you wanted with it. How could you do a thing like this? You aren't lying to us, but God. Now, verse 5, which is, which is why it's sometimes a harder passage to preach. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. And instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Colonnade. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I pray that you would take the words of this passage... And speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you're trying to say, okay, where is he going with this message? Well, to be a church on the move, you cannot be what like Ananias and Sapphira did. They held back. They kept back. One of the greatest threats after 20 plus years of working with churches, one of the greatest threats to the church in the United States is not from the outside, but the inside. You see, Satan often subtly places antagonists inside the church. And sometimes these people are often, because of a need or because they have money or influence, soon become leaders in the church. And they, they soon either through chaos or misdirected wisdom set a course for the church that's opposite direction from God's plan. Meaning you, you, you begin to, to stop saying, well, what would God want to do? What is it that God is leading us? And, and you move to the point of saying, this is what we're doing. We have no need to pray. But a church on the move lets the Lord set the course and direction of the church. And a church on the move is daily cognizant that it's his church, not ours. We're just stewards of it. Now you're wondering, that was awful harsh. Why did God strike them dead? Well, I believe one of the reasons was that 
in the beginning of this church, God wanted to place his holiness front and center. And he did not want to have any imposters or anybody turning the course of this work. He wanted future believers to know that God is a holy God. Peter said to Ananias, how is it that Satan has, has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? And you ask yourself, how do we lie to God? We lie to God when we hold back that which we've promised to God. Now, let me say that again. We lie to God when we hold back what we've promised to God. And, and you might be saying, well, what have I promised to God that I'm holding back? And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, so what have we promised God? You promised God when you became a believer, when you surrendered your life to God, you promised God everything. Because when you call him Lord, you say, everything is yours. And so there's several, th several things that we hold back on. And if we want to be a church on the move, if you want to be a church that, that, that is growing, a church that causes God to smile, then you don't hold back in the area of unity. Unity. Remember I talked about the verses before chapter 5, and it's talking about uh, that they were selling lands. Look what it says in verse uh, chapter 4 of Acts, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. There was, there was unity. And yet, after 54, almost 55 years of life, and looking and looking and looking at churches, I see more disunity than unity. I, I see, you know, and growing up in South Carolina, I saw many churches that, when a church just did not like their pastor, they decided to do whatever it took to get rid of him. He became the enemy. Now, I remember when I uh, came to pastor in South Carolina, and I had seen all the different churches, and, and, and God was bringing me to this church. And when I got there, I went into the, to the archives of the church and I began to look at their history of the last 50 years and I saw that no pastor, but about two or three, lasted more than two years. And I said, Lord, you brought me to a fighting church. You brought me to a church without unity. And yet what I saw over the four years when you can keep your eyes on Jesus and not the color of the carpet, you have more chance to be unified. When four or five months ago, if I was to describe your church here, I would not have described it unified. There was points where you were, everyone was confused and and wondering what was happening. And Satan clearly 
wanted your church to disappear. Which tells me something. Because Satan does not have unlimited resources that he is awful scared of what might happen if the people at Wise Drive become what God wants them to be. And after you paused, you began to see that closing the doors was not God's direction. And there was more life. If we're going to be a church on the move, we need to not hold back, but act, but strive wholeheartedly and totally toward unity. Now, it does not mean that we all agree. But when we disagree, we disagree peaceably. Meaning that when we disagree, when it's done, we shake hands and go out the door... And we don't pick up the phone and say, wow, did you hear what happened? There are several challenges to unity. Pride, jealousy, complaining, disputing. What I have found in 30-some, 20-some or so years of working with churches, one of the biggest killers of unity is gossip. Gossip. I, I found this definition of gossip. And it said, my name is gossip. I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I'm cunning and malicious and gather strength with age. The more I am quoted, the more I am believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no face. To track me down is impossible. And the harder you try, the more elusive I become. I am nobody's friend. Once I tarnish a reputation, it is never the same. I topple governments, wreck marriages, ruin careers, cause sleepless nights, heartaches, and indigestion. I spawn suspicion and generate grief. I make innocent people cry in their pillows. Even my name hisses. I make headlines and headaches. So when it comes to gossip, if you don't remember anything else I'm saying, remember this. Are you ready? Before you repeat a story, ask yourself first, is it true? Before you repeat it, ask yourself, is it true? Second, is it fair? Is it fair... Third, is it necessary? Is it necessary? And if not, stay silent. Is it true? Is it fair? Is it necessary? Does it need to be spoken? It's kind of like uh, the cartoon character Thumper. If you don't have nothing good to say, don't say what? Nothing at all. If Wise Drive is going to be the church where we see lives changed by the gospel, then we need to imitate God with our words or perhaps our lack of words. Now, I heard this story uh, this week, and I, 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 you know, I usually like to tell you that it's a funny story, so it's 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 pretty tough if you're preaching and. It's supposed to be funny and, and, and no one laughs. So just kind of prepare yourself so you can laugh. Mount Zion Baptist Church was a good church. But they had a major problem with gossip. And one of the main culprits was Harriet. They nicknamed her Go Ahead Gossip Harriet. 
And she was the self-appointed supervisor of the church's morals. Her nose was in everybody's business. Some members hated what she did, but most were too scared of her to speak up. That was until she crossed George's path. She accused George, a member of the church, of being an alcoholic after she saw his truck outside the town's only bar. Now, George was a man of few words who only stared at her and then quietly walked away. But later that evening, George got even. He quietly parked his pickup truck in front of Harriet's house and left it there all night. I'm glad somebody got it. Gossip is a powerful killer of unity. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Second, if you want to be a church on the move, you cannot keep back, you cannot hold back your gifts, your time, your talents, your treasures, your tithe. Now I'm really meddling, talking about tithing, aren't I? I found these results the other day. I believe it speaks about our heart. 10% of the church members... 10% of church members cannot be found. 20% of church members never attend church. 25% admit they never pray. 35% admit they do not read their Bibles. 40% admit that they never contribute to the church. 60% never give to missions. 70% never assume responsibility within the church. 85% never invite anyone to church. And 95% have never won anyone to church, Christ, but 100% expect to go to heaven. Now, I'm not saying that, that we're saved by our works, but hear this. Our works that we do, do echo the heart of God. It, 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 we're saved by grace and faith, but there needs to be some sort of change. And we, we could camp here a long, long time. The late Larry Burkett, a financial expert, said, if every church member in America would increase their giving an average of 10%, because current giving estimates are at 3%, there would be an extra 69% billion dollars for overseas missions and an additional 150 billion in income for American churches. If we're going to be a church on the move, you, you, you can't hold back on your gifts, on your time, and on your tithe. There will always be excuses to say, well, have you seen my bank account? But let me tell you something. If you want to see the everyday miracle, then give God 10% and watch what he does. There was a church that whose treasurer resigned. And in their search for a new treasurer, they approached the local grain operation manager. This was a rural kind of church. He agreed under two conditions. That no treasurer report would be given for the first year. And no questions about finances during that year. The people were surprised, but they agreed since they really trusted the man. And mo most everybody in the church did business with him. At the end of the year, he gave his report. The church debt of $228,000 has been paid. The minister's salary has been increased by 8%. The mission's giving has been increased 
by 200%. There are no outstanding bills. And we have a cash balance of $12,000. The shock congregation said, how did you do it? Where did the money come from? He quietly answered, most of you bring your grain to my elevator. Throughout the year, I simply withheld 10% on your behalf and gave it to the church in your name. You didn't even miss it. You see what we could do for the Lord if we all just willingly gave our tithe? I talk a lot about money. You can never, ever outgive God. Finally, if we're going to be on a church on the move, we need to hold not to not hold back, not keep back our total love and devotion. Revelations 2, 4, and 5 says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We hold back our love and devotion when we don't give Jesus our all, when we hang on to life's substitutes. Some of our life substitutes are our money, our stuff, for some folks, it's pornography or other sexual experiences that take the place of God. Some of our, our stuff could be our careers, our thirst for position and status, our hobbies, our need to control, our need to be self-sufficient. And the list could go on. Self-sufficient really is God, we can do it, and we don't need you. I heard the story a good while ago. The little bouncy little girl, she's a little bit older than Christine's daughter. She's five years old. She's waiting for her mother at the checkout stand, which if you ever have children at the checkout stand, it's not a real pleasant place because they place all these impulse buys. And there's al always something that you, and if your kids are really sh uh, smart, while you're not looking, it just kind of goes in and then you find that you've bought this item. And, and there in the checkout stand was this glittering white pearl in a pink foil box. Please, 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 mommy, can I have them? Those pearls look so great. I want them. The mother checked the back of the, the, uh, the foil box. She saw that it was $1.95. It's almost $2, the mom said. If you really, really want these pearls, then I'll give you some extra chores, and you can do it, and... I bet if you rake your yard, you can get a little bit. And, and you know that your birthday is coming up and your grandmother always gives you a dollar. As soon as Jenny got home, she emptied her penny bank and counted out 17 pennies. After she, dinner, she did more than her chores. She asked Miss McJames if she could pick dandelions for 10 cents. And on her birthday, Grandma did give her the, the new dollar bill, and at last she had enough money to buy the necklace. Man, Jenny loved her pearls. They made her feel so dressed up and grown up. She wore them everywhere, Sunday school, kindergarten, even to bed. And the only time she took them off was when she went swimming or had a bubble bath because her mother said if they got wet, it would turn her neck green. I 
Jenny had an incredible loving daddy. And every night when, he was, when she was ready for bed, he'd stop whatever he was doing and come upstairs and read her a story. One night when he finished the story, he asked Jenny, Jenny, do you love me? Oh, yes, Daddy, I love you. I, you know I love you. Then, then, then give me your pearls. Oh, 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 Daddy, not my pearls, but you can have Princess, the white horse from my collection, the one with the pink tail. Remember, Daddy, the one you gave me? She's my favorite. That's okay, honey. Daddy loves you. Good night. And he brushed her cheek with a kiss. About a week later during story time, Jenny's daddy asked again, Jenny, do you love me? Daddy, you know I love you. Then, then, then give me your pearls. Oh, daddy, not my pearls, but you can have my baby doll, the brand new one for my birthday. She's so beautiful. And you can have the yellow blanket that matches her sleeper. That's okay. Sleep well. God bless you. Daddy loves you. And as always, he brushed her cheek with a kiss. A few nights later, when her daddy came in, Jenny was sitting on her bed with her cross, her legs crossed Indian style. As he came close, he noticed her chin was trembling, and one silent tear rolled down her cheek. What is it, Jenny? What's the matter? Jenny didn't say anything, but lifted her little hand up to her daddy. And when she opened it, there was the little pearl necklace. With a little quiver, she finally said, here, daddy, it's for you. With tears gathering in his own eyes, Jenny's kind daddy reached out with one hand to take the dime store $1.95 necklace and with the other hand he reached in his pocket and pulled out a blue velvet case with a strand of genuine pearls that he gave to Jenny. You, you see, the dad had the genuine pearls all the time. He was just waiting for her to give up the dime store imitation stuff so he could give her genuine treasure. What are you hanging on to? What are you hanging on to? And the Lord has so, so, so much more. You just got to let it go. If Wise Drive is going to be a church on the move, if Wise Drive is going to be a church that honors the Lord, then you've got to, like the great theologian Elsa, let it go. Let it go. You cannot hold back for unity. I, I, I love it when people try to come and gossip to me. Because you see, when they come, and it usually has one of these events, and sometimes it's right before you even preach, and I say, wait, 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 stop for a second. I said, you're really talking about that person over there, and and they should be a part of the conversation because evidently you've got something to say to that person. So I say, come, come here. And the person just kind of gets all well, pale. And I say, I, I got to, y'all finish it. Obviously, y'all need to talk. Strive for unity. Don't hold back on your time and your talents and your treasures. Just because there's not something currently at Wise Drive that doesn't fit your talents, it doesn't mean that it needs, that you don't have a place. Maybe you just need to create it. 
Don't hold back by holding on to life substitutes. Because God's got so much better for you. Amen? Well, as we come to a, a time of invitation, you, um, I, I, I brag on you guys an awful lot. Because God is moving and you have stood and fought. And that day, I want to be there when that first Sunday, when your new pastor is here, whomever that person is, and celebrate with you. Because the best is yet to come, but it's in your hands. Are you going to let God use you? In just a little bit, we're going to have a time of invitation. It's not the time for you to begin to gather your stuff. It really is a time for you to reflect on what you've heard. We're so busy. By the time you leave out here, you'll have 100 calls. And many of you, because of COVID, are sitting just by yourself. So use this time to reflect and ask the Lord, is there anything in my life I'm holding back and not giving to you? Some of you, every time there's a paycheck, you get a nudge that you need to give a tithe. And you wonder, how could I give it? And God says, trust me. Some of you, God's saying to give to search something, and it makes no sense, but God says, trust me. The saying in our house, and I said it before, is you cannot outgive God. And maybe there's something right now that's competing for first place in your life. And you keep saying, Lord, I am here. I am yours. And then this other thing just gets your attention. And you, like a ping pong match, you go back and forth. Maybe today you just need to say, Lord, I am yours. And so I'll be standing up here if you want to pray with me. But I would say, whether, you're, whether you are here or if you want to come and kneel, just do business with the Lord today. Let's pray together. Jesus, take the words that have been shared and move in ways that only you can move. May we not be the same. May we let it go and not hold back So that we can be the men and women that God's called us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. You come as God leads. Would you stand? Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior 
all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long.
is amazing grace.